My name is Samantha Audia. I'm an intern with Claire Booth Luce, and I'll be a junior at the University of Michigan Ann Arbor this year. Frank Dontelli has been promoting conservative ideas in Washington, D.C. for more than 40 years, and he has served as secretary treasurer for the Claire Booth Luce Policy Institute for the last 21 years. He is currently the vice president and director of federal public affairs of McGuire Woods Consulting, a tremendously respected public affairs firm. A graduate of the University of Pittsburgh and American University Law School, Mr. Donatelli has had many great positions, including serving as President Reagan's political director at the Reagan White House and deputy assistant for President Reagan for public liaison. He also headed the Africa Bureau at the Agency for International Development and served on a White House team that negotiated presidential debates in 1984. He also was a senior advisor to Secretary Bob Dole, representing his campaign in presidential campaign negotiations. His first job in Washington that he took right out of law school was executive director of Young Americans for Freedom, which is now part of the Young Americans Foundation. In his current position at McGuire Woods, Mr. Donatelli represents companies in an extraordinarily diverse range of policy topics, including energy, taxes, trade, telecommunications, and also homeland security. Mr. Donatelli utilizes his passion for communications frequently, having appeared on CNN, Fox News, and MSNBC. He has also authored articles for the New York Daily News, the Washington Post, and the Washington Times. More recently, in 2008, Frank served as deputy chairman of the Republican National Committee, where he coordinated the fundraising and organizing aspects of the McCain-Palin campaign. Among his many accolades, he is also chairman of the Reagan Ranch Board of Governors for the Young Americas Foundation. In March 2009, Frank was elected as chairman of GOPAC, a group that assists Republican rising stars in running for state and local office. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Frank Donatelli, from whose vast range of experiences we can all learn so much. Great. Uh, Samantha, thank you so much. Hello to everyone. I hope you're enjoying your summer so far. Where are all of you from? The East Coast? How many from the SEC? That must be Alabama. You put your hand up on there. Okay, University of Mississippi. Uh, ACC, a lot of ACC. How about out west, Pac-10, Pac Big Ten? Well, from all over the place. Well, that's really the first thing that I was going to say when I get started here is that you're from all across the country, and I really hope that you take this opportunity uh, while you're in the nation's capital here to get the best possible experience that you can. It's going to stand you in very, very good stead for the rest of your working life. Um, I resisted, uh, I think the original title of my talk was 40 years in Washington. My God, I mean, it just makes me look old. And even Moses got the Jews out of the desert after 40 years, and I'm still, <laughs> and I'm still doing this. But it's because I like doing it. That's the most important thing. Um, the other thing was I got mixed up on the rooms here. I don't, this is the North Congressional Room. I don't know if you know, there's a meeting taking place in the South Cong Congressional Room entitled, We the People, Not the Corporations. I didn't think I was going to be speaking to those individuals. I, I don't know if the most aggrieved people in America, in, in America are the people. I think the most aggrieved people in America are the taxpayers. In fact, just think for a second about, you're all people now, but when you become taxpayers and actually have to give money to the government as opposed to the government trying to bribe you by giving you money, wait and see how your, uh, how your uh, attitude changes as far as the government is concerned. It's always amazed me that the people that actually make possible all these programs that politicians talk about endlessly are the most uh, ill-treated people in America, namely the taxpayers. Um, in any event, I digress. Um, I want to talk to you today, and uh, I am mindful of the fact that I am your last speaker before you get to go back to your congressional offices, and I know you're all dying to do that or go back to your summer jobs. Um, but uh, since uh, it already has come out that I've been kicking around this town for 40 years, uh, what I did want to talk to you about, I'm going to give you 
Frank's 10 rules for being successful in Washington in the long term. And uh, some of them are, are ideologically neutral. Some of them touch on the idea that I think a number of you think about all the time is, when I get out to that big bad world, how can I remain true to my principles? So I'm going to try to talk about a little bit about um, some things to think about. Now, I know that you've already had uh, seminars on communications and how to be a pundit. That's one of my favorite. If I could have been a pundit all my life and get paid for it, that would have made uh, things a lot easier for me. Um, I do that part-time, but that's not my full-time job. So I'm going to talk, just talk about if you want to stay in this town, how can you be successful no matter what you do. And indeed, a lot of these lessons I just think apply to life, not just in Washington. But since we're here, that's what they asked me to talk about. So borrowing from Letterman's top 10, um, number 10, expand your universe. Just as the real universe, I'm told, I'm not a physicist, but I can play one on TV if necessary, but just as the universe has expanded since the beginning, whatever that was, so your world should also expand. And what I mean by that is, beginning this summer, you have a job and you're working in your congressional office or you're working at your internship or whatever, and that's good and that's important, but take this opportunity to meet as many different people as you can from as many different areas as you possibly can. I came to Washington as an intern two years before I came here for my first job full time. And what I remember about that experience is it was kind of fun what I was doing, but what I remembered most are the friendships that I made during that summer because I took every opportunity I could to go to every free thing that's offered in Washington. And if you've been here just a couple of weeks, you know there's a lot of free stuff here that's really terrific. Receptions, and the great thing about receptions is you can get free shrimp, you can meet a member of Congress, you can meet their staff. Um, there are activities. Um, there are so many different things in Washington. I don't think I have to tell this group, if you're bored in Washington, D.C., you are the dullest person that I have ever met. And I think you know it, it, there's lots of things going on here. So my advice is take this opportunity. I used to say build your Rolodex. And of course that's another tip off as to how old I am. Does anyone know what a Rolodex is? Good, because no one has one anymore. Build your list of contacts. Build your list of contacts. I find that no matter how much time goes by, I can identify people at different phases in my life which normally is a summer job or, as I got older, a, uh, an electoral cycle. So to this day, I'll say, oh yeah, George Smith, I know him from the Dole campaign. Or, yeah, he worked with me with Bush. Or, um, I remember him from this project we worked on. It's just amazing when you make friendships at this stage in your life, they have the potential to last for a very, very long time and you never know when you might want to run into that person again. I, uh, the last time, the last thing I'm going to tell you about why I've been in town too long is that um, uh, we had a Young America's Foundation seminar a couple of weeks ago and uh, we had Senator Hatch speak and his Deputy Chief of Staff came up to me, introduced himself, he said, I'm so-and-so. He said, I think you worked with my father in the Reagan administration and indeed I had. But the point is that uh, I had stayed in touch with him and that was still a pretty good contact for me to have all these years later because I'm still doing what I'm doing. So that's number 10, expand your universe. Number 9, it's, it's what you know as much as who you know. And I know that the popular belief uh, in a lot of circles is in Washington it's, you just have to know the right people. And as somebody who's been doing this a long time, I can tell you that's just not true. If you want to be successful in the long term, that's certainly not true. It might be true in the short term. A new administration comes to power, or the person that you worked for on the Hill becomes chairman of an important committee. Yes, you'll be a big deal for a while. But if that's all you bring to the table, beside knowing that person, um, that goes away pretty quickly. 
because there's somebody new that's always coming along. And more importantly, it's evident very, very clearly whether or not you're somebody that actually knows something specific or it's just that you know the right people. This is a niche town and um, expertise is very, very important. Whether uh, you develop uh, a policy expertise or whether you go on to get a degree in business or in law or you become a graduate teacher or whatever, um, it's really important if you want to succeed um, in the long term uh, that you have real expertise on something and not just because you're friends with people in power. That's number nine. Um, oh, here's a good one. Number eight, don't make enemies needlessly because you'll make plenty of them in the normal course. And um, I guess what I mean by that is that Washington, there are most of the, of the arrangements in Washington, D.C. depend heavily on volunteers. Um, this is not GM where um, everybody um, is a paid person and there's a hierarchy and there's an established culture. In Washington, most organizations, certainly congressional offices, and most interest groups that you might work with reconstitute themselves all the time. And there's always jockeying going on for a position, somebody trying to get up higher, somebody uh, losing out, and so forth and so on. And so in the normal course of all that, you know, you're just going to run into situations where despite your best efforts, somebody is going to hold a grudge, they're going to be mad at you, and so forth and so on. Don't go out of your way to make enemies needlessly because um, in the normal course of things, you're going to bump heads with a lot of people. Actually, I use the word enemies, really not enemies, adversaries is the, the better way to put it. You know, our enemies are abroad. Um, even if somebody is on the other side of us, um, they're adversaries. And more importantly, just because they're adversaries now doesn't mean that they won't be allies down the road. And you all you want to kind of keep a little bit of camaraderie, even if there's somebody that you disagree with. Uh, if you can at least keep some personal relationship with that person, you'll find that at a later time and a later date, there's somebody that you can actually work together with. Uh, let's see, number seven, change is inevitable, learn to adapt. And you've already had uh, seminars this morning on, I think, communications, journalism, uh, being a pundit. Um, my career has involved uh, public affairs and lobbying. It's involved law, and it's involved campaigns, and it's involved conservative causes also. And what I can tell you about all of those pursuits is when I started here all those years ago, the way all of those businesses function now are totally different from what it was all those years ago. And if you're not constantly thinking about the next thing as to how that particular uh, career that you've chosen is going to evolve, um, you're going to be out and uh, you're going to not be able to advance. So um, when I was, uh, years ago when I was taking my daughter around to look at colleges, I remember one of the people that we met at one of the colleges gave the best advice I ever heard. He said to her, find out what you're good at and what you like to do, and then get people to pay you. And um, all of Washington, D.C. is a service, is a series of service businesses, and I think that's pretty good advice. Always be thinking about within your chosen field what slightly different thing you might be able to do um, that would get you noticed or indeed would um, get you uh, a career breakthrough on your own. Um, number six, don't lose track of the real world. How many of you have seen the movie Goodfellas? Anybody have seen that a long time ago? I know. But um, it's a movie about it's a movie about the, uh, the New York mob, and one of the characters in the movie is talking, and she says, talking about the mob, talking about her friends, she said, we ate together, we vacationed together, and we all had holidays together, and we very seldom saw anyone else. That's what life in the mob was like. Um, I think you want to make sure 
that wherever you go in life, you have a variety of experiences, and you have different people that you're talking to. I think it's a real mistake whether you work for a religion and you're only talk to your fellow people of the same religion, or whether you're in a highly ideological uh, uh, cause uh, and you only talk to your people that think exactly like you, or you work in a congressional office, or you work for, a, for the oil companies and all you do is talk to other people in the oil industry or whatever, that you're shortchanging yourself because so much of being successful in this town is, is understanding public opinion and most importantly, understanding what motivates people. I'm always interested in history. I love reading historical novels, partially just for the who, what, why, and where, but also because of motivations. I mean, the fascinating thing about reading history, whether it's American history or whether it's European history or, um, or whatever, uh, whether it's world history, is that motivations don't change. And so you read about things and how they how they, uh, how they move forward, and um, the motivations of people are very predictable. Um, and uh, so if you want to be successful, I think understanding what motivates people um, and what drives policy allows you to predict a little better as to what kinds of things are going to happen. An important part of there is, um, is just trying to get out to the community and being exposed to uh, a variety of, of different people. I, um, over Memorial Day, um, I helped out a friend um, for a community affairs event in Vienna, Virginia, which is in Northern Virginia here. And uh, so I was at a booth and giving out literature and just greeting people and so forth. And I must tell you, I was just I mean, the variety of people there, both from a demographic perspective and from a philosophical perspective, and just talking about their families and what's important to their families, I probably learned more. It was like a gigantic focus group for an entire day. Not that necessarily um, it was uh, scientifically accurate, but just hearing directly from individual citizens the hopes and the challenges that they and their family face um, I just found fascinating. So the more that you can stay connected to the broad cross-section of Americans, I think that will stand you in, in very, very good stead. Um, number five, pick your spots. You won't save the world every day. And what I mean by that is that um, the best baseball player doesn't hit a home run every time they're up. Even the best quarterback throws an interception now and then. Um, not every event in your life is live or is life or death, and not every day are you going to solve all the world's problems. Um, Samantha said that one of the things I do is I'm chairman of GOPAC, and my uh, executive director uh, was invited to be on the Bill Maher show. And I don't know, what do you think about that? Should, should he have gone on the Bill Maher show? Does anybody watch Bill Maher? Um, he's, uh, you know, he's kind of a tough guy. He does not, um, I mean, he has a viewpoint very specific and uh, is very not bashful about uh, speaking it, and it's most of the time not a conservative viewpoint. So he asked my advice, and I said, well, look, here's what I think. If you expect to go on that show and convince Bill Maher and all of his uh, people in the audience, all of whom think like him, um, that he's been wrong all these years and that conservatism is the right path, don't do it. You're going to be disappointed and you're going to get into a chowding match probably with him and um, it's not going to be a very good experience. If, on the other hand, you see this as an opportunity maybe to raise some questions uh, with the adoring leftists that follow him, and maybe you could say something that would cause him to say, hmm, I hadn't considered that before. Um, yes, I've done MSNBC as a pundit, and uh, because I, if all we do is talk to each other all the time, um, then 
I don't think we're doing everything we should do or we could do because by definition, if we've lost the last two campaigns, we need to we need to get more allies. So my attitude is, if they'll put me on, and if I can just raise one fact in my appearance with them, uh, that we're we're the host or with with the mo or with people watching, say, hmm, I'd thought about that before. I've done my job. I mean, I've had a successful day as far as that appearance and as far as doing something for the cause that day. Um, does it change uh, the world? No, it doesn't. But um, we all do what we can do every day. And I think that's how you ought to approach things. You, some of you have said, well, how can I be true to my beliefs um, in a very secular world? That's one way to do it, is don't lose those beliefs, but always look to advance them, even if it's incrementally because you never know what sort of a spark that might, that might strike. Um, number four, um, there are many ways to serve the cause. And it's really kind of a follow-up to what I had just said. I think it's really important, no matter what you go on to do, and most of you probably won't work for the conservative movement full-time, it doesn't mean there aren't a lot of things that you can do. You can get involved with candidates. You can write letters to the editor. Um, you can get involved in your local party organization. You can stay involved as an advisor to some of these conservative groups. There are all kinds of ways that you can uh, stay involved. I like, and I think equally important by staying active, is always question. Question your beliefs. Always make sure that um, Always make sure that you're taking account of situations and new facts, and so are con comfortable kind of advocating. Conservatism is not Marxism. Marxism was a set of preconceived notions. Conservatism is a set of broad principles, which change over time a little bit, given what the, what the facts of the day are. When I came here years ago, the most important issues were students rebelling on campus, the Vietnam War, um, those were two of them. And, and communism, how do we deal with communism? Well, none of those are really relevant anymore. So if I hadn't continued to re-examine my first principles, um, maybe I wouldn't be active in the cause anymore. But conservatism is that the principles are flexible and can be adapted to uh, most of uh, any time in our history. Certainly the idea of big versus small government is a principle that where the facts change, the issues change, but uh, the basic uh, mindset does not change. I mean, either you're small government or you're big government, you're socialist. I also find that if I can write on topics once in a while, that really helps to frame things for me. When I sit down to write an article, I often wind up with unique reasoning, not necessarily a different conclusion, but a different way to get to that conclusion that I wouldn't have if I hadn't taken that hour or so to sit down and do that. So I find writing helpful in that regard. Maybe you would too, again, as a way to clear your mind and uh, to keep you focused on the right things. Um, and then the final thing under this, I would say, is set, I always try to set a good example. And what I mean by that is, um, to my adversaries, I always try to appear to be reasonable and well-informed so that when an issue comes to the fore, um, they would say something like, well, let's ask Donatelli. He's a Republican or he's a conservative. And he's, I always try to have um, you know, my thinking up to date so that I can, again, going back to the idea of what can you do on a daily basis, who knows, maybe you can convince one of your co-workers um, about the wisdom of our position. Um, again, one-on-one, uh, -on -one, day by day, more often than not. I think I got that in college, and you're probably in the same situation, even though the students aren't occupying the dean's office anymore. I doubt that very many of you are from colleges where the overwhelming proportion of the faculty are conservatives. Is, is there such a place? Uh, any of you go to those places? I certainly don't. So I always felt um, that I needed to be better informed so that, uh, you know, so if I stood up and advocated my position, 
with a professor, I find most of them reasonable enough that if you made a good argument for your point of view, that you would get credit for that. Um, so it helps you to grow up quickly. Um, if you're a conservative on campus or even in the real world, just to know uh, what you believe and what the right facts are. I think you'd be surprised as to, um, as to how successful you might be with, uh, with some of your coworkers. So I'm down to number three. Um, keep a sense of humor. Um, or don't take yourself so seriously all the time. I really wish um, some of our leftist friends would heed this advice, but when you're trying to save, well, I used to say when you're trying to save our country, now of course they're trying to save the planet. That of course is a full-time job and requires them to be as grim and uncompromising um, as possible. Uh, and unfortunately that has seeped into political dialogue too. It always strikes me um, how amazing it is that more politicians don't see the wisdom in self-deprecation. I mean, do you know any politicians today that will make fun of themselves and, and try to, I mean, heaven think that this president would think that he's anything but perfect in every way, shape, or form. I mean, can you imagine him um, making, poking even gentle fun at, at himself? I doubt it. Um, that was one of the things about President Reagan that made him uh, so successful and so admired and so lovable, if you will, is that people, even if they didn't agree with him, um, really took to him personally and felt comfortable with him. Um, I mean, who else? Uh, it, it takes a politician very comfortable in their own skin to say, as he did, you know, when he was accused of falling asleep in cabinet meetings and so forth, He's a, he, was, he once said, um, some people say that hard work never killed anybody, but I say, why take the chance? Um, or he would always make fun of his age. Um, you know, Thomas Jefferson once said, uh, liberty is the core of, of, our, of our being. And ever since Jefferson told me that, Reagan would say. Um, so, and of course, that famous line, in his debate with uh, Walter Mondale in 1984, where he said when he was, he was being uh, criticized for being too old, he said, I won't make age an issue in this campaign. I don't intend to my, exploit my, my opponent's youth and inexperience. Um, was the, it was the highlight of the debate, probably one in the election right there. My point is that even politicians not taking themselves so seriously could be so much more attractive than they are and unfortunately, in this hyper-partisan era, very few of them do. That might be something that you might try to do. Again, as a way of convincing some of our fellow workers or students or whatever about our cause. Um, number two, sometimes asking the right question is more important than having all the answers. And uh, there's probably a person in your class or that you work with that knows everything. You know, they have their hand up all the time, or they're constantly speaking in meetings, and uh, no matter what the question is, they've got ten reasons or ten facts that uh, they think no one else knows except them. They like to hear themselves talk. A lot of times, the most important thing is not just raw facts, but rather, what's the right question? And I remember a situation when I worked when I was working uh, for President Reagan. And um, we were tasked with building public support for a particular nominee. I was a cabinet position, and I don't recall who it was, quite honestly, but it was somebody who was somewhat controversial. So the whole meeting went on, and we said, well, look, you're going to talk to this group, and you're going to talk to this group, and uh, we're going to get these people in here for a briefing, and so forth and so on. And finally, at the end of the meeting, one of my people stood up and said, I just have one question. If we had, and I said, what's that? He said, if we had to summarize why this person should be confirmed in two sentences, what would it be? And I uh, <laughs> well, never thought of that before. Well, that's obviously where we, he didn't know the answer, um, but that's obviously where we should have started. Um, but we jumped that step and talked about implementation and tactics and didn't focus on the strategic rationale as to why this was a good nomination. And we actually had to go back up the chain and try to rework that first start. So 
A lot of times, to get ahead, it's not just spouting off statistics. It's really trying to focus on those things that are most important. Um, and then the final thing, and I think I'm finishing, believe it or not, just on time here, don't be afraid to take chances. Um, you know, new things are hard. If they weren't hard, they'd have been done by now. Um, and so anytime you have kind of a different take on things, um, conventional wisdom is going to be against you, and a lot of people are going to poo-poo what you're saying. But um, a lot of times, it's that insight that you have you have to trust your instincts. And sometimes you want to think things through, but at the same time, it's very possible that you have a different take on something uh, that no one else does. Um, that's how these great corporations um, get formed. Um, you know, Google and uh, all these companies began with somebody of a very modest background having an idea, having an instinct as to what they would like to do. Um, my uh, my uh, ex-wife um, is somebody that I admire very much. Um, she had a career in real estate, and yet she had a vision that politics could be revolutionized um, using the web. And so she put together a company, that, uh, and they took the first online donation um, ever. Uh, from any for any politician was Governor Pataki, George Pataki of uh, New York, 1998 or something like that. Um, and and of course now it's a staple of campaigning how important the web is. So um, uh, you never know where that great um, inspiration is going to come from, uh, but you owe it to yourselves if you want to be successful. More importantly. If you want to have an interesting life, you don't just want 40 hours, get your paycheck, go home, and say to, my, say to yourself, God, when's, when am I going to retire? Um, you know, that's, uh, that's hopefully not what you want to do. I'll just close on this. I was watching um, a few months ago, about six months ago, one of those, please don't hold this against me, one of, these, one of those Barbara Walters specials. Um, and it was not if you were a tree, what kind of a tree would you want to be? Um, she actually, I think, has some interesting interviews. She gets people to say things sometimes. And she was interviewing George Clooney, the actor. And she was asking him, well, you know, you've been successful. Um, what's next in your life? And George Clooney said, you know, he said, I, I've been blessed with great success. From now on, I want to do things in my life that are relevant, meaningful, and make a real difference. And I thought to myself, you know, that's what I do, and that's what all of you want to do. Now, he's richer than I am, um, he's better looking than I am, certainly has more hair than I do, uh, but he wants to do what I do. And so I know that that's why I'm on the right track. Um, I get up every day still after all these years saying, how can I do a good job in my job, and how can I make a difference? And uh, if if that's where you wind up in life, I don't know where it's going to lead you, but I can promise you it will be a very interesting, successful, and useful life. Thank you. So, um, I don't know if we have time or if there are any questions, but I'd be happy to respond to anything that you might have. Uh, yes, ma'am. Could you say I right here? And can you say your name to Samantha from the University of Michigan? I have a question. Very recently, I found myself in a conversation with some token liberals who said that the Constitution, as time has gone on, has become less relevant because it was written such a long time ago. And I'm curious, as someone who's worked in DC for the last 40 years, what you would have to say about the Constitution as a living document. Well, I guess you could say, this, did everybody hear that question about the continuing relevance of the Constitution? I guess they would really hate the Ten Commandments, right? Because that was, so, I'd just like to know at what point things become irrelevant if you're just purely looking at it at the time. Um, I think that is, that person summarized the liberal view of the Constitution, which is, and of course, that's what the President believes. 
president believes that restraints on government are what he calls negative liberty. Um, and that in, in their belief is government by pure majority, even if it's a momentary majority, should be able to do whatever it wants. I remember during the Obamacare debate, um, a newsman asked Nancy Pelosi, the former Democratic Speaker of the House, uh, quote, could you cite me precisely the article of the Constitution that gives the government the power to provide uh, health care? And she looked at him like he was from Mars because the, her inherent belief is Congress can do whatever, whatever we want Congress can do. And um, that is not what conservatives believe. Conservatives believe that the people individually retain all rights unless we collectively give them to government. So um, there has to be, an affir in, in, in the conservative view, there has to be a, cons a, a, a grant of power, specifically in the Constitution or implied power or whatever, to the government, to the federal government especially, and then that government can act. If you can't cite such a power, then government does not have the ability to act, does not have the constitutional authority to act. Um, and um, the good news is that I think five justices of the Supreme Court believe that. The bad news is that one of those five justices did not want to provoke a confrontation with the executive and came up with this cockamamie idea that Obamacare could be sustained under the taxing power. No one believes that any of these things are taxes. But anyway, so it's a continuing debate. Remember I said that conservatism is a set of principles which is relevant over a long period of time. And I can't think of a more central principle to our national life than um, what powers the federal government has and under what circumstances are they allowed to exercise it. My name is Haley Jones, and I'm an intern at Young America's Foundation. And I'm just kind of wondering for all of us that kind of want to get on the hill in the future, what's the most important skill that we need to be honing that people like you are looking for? Um, yeah, I, that's a thank you for that question. Um, if you want to, there's no substitute for making yourself. Let me just say it this way: there's no substitute for making yourself useful for to politicians. Politicians all want to get elected. And politicians need lots of help in getting elected. And they will grab it to, and, and in staying in, 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 in their office, not just getting elected, but doing a good job when they're in office. So they're going to gravitate toward people that have skills that can help them either to get elected or to stay in office once they are elected. So what are those skills? Well, fundraising is obviously true. Um, organizing, if you're in the campaign, um, if you're trying to run a successful office, um, either administrative skills or uh, policy skills, the modern uh, congressional office today deals with an extraordinary array of, uh, of issues because the federal government is so big. And um, is it true that most politicians don't read the bills? Of course they don't read the bills because they don't have the time to do that. But they do need people, A, who read the bills, and B, can explain the essence of the bills to them. So having um, skills in, in that regard um, and then developing an expertise in a policy area, whether it be energy or health care or financial services or foreign affairs or whatever, um, that's a very, very good way of being useful to a politician so that you can, so that you can work for him or her. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. Um, is it okay to ask two questions? Or you touch on one? No, one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, um, the first question I had was whether your work with President Reagan influences your role in OPEC at all? Well, I, um, the answer, I guess, is yes, for a couple of reasons. Number one, Reagan was a governor, um, and he always had great respect for governors and legislators and so forth. And so GOPAC focuses a lot of its mission on training conservative legislators to be good legislators and then to move up uh, to national office. So that was a natural thing. Um, secondly, uh, the, you know, 
Um, Ray, you know, Reagan was one man in time, but of all of our presidents, I think he probably best, he was probably the purest conservative we, we've ever had in the sense that if, if you just asked him about issues, he would immediately look at the Constitution, he would look at the Federalist Papers, he would look at, you know, Milton Friedman's writings, on, and that's how he would base his answer. So on a um, just unaided test, Reagan was probably the best pure conservative we've ever had. And what we do try to teach candidates at GOPAC is, uh, don't be too cute, okay? Um, uh, I, we understand political considerations have to apply if you're going to get elected. On the other hand, um, don't try to parse every answer. Sometimes people like the fact that you're giving them the straight dope on something. Even if it's not everything they want to hear, they will admire your candor. I think that was one of Reagan's uh, good, qu good qualities. And so to that extent, Reagan's kind of message in life has continued to influence not just our candidates, but our party. I know it's not a partisan gathering, but uh, a, a, the Republican uh, candidates uh, are uh, all say that they are still influenced by Reagan, I think pers uh, primarily for that reason. And then, um, the second question was, you mentioned in your tip number two about taking risks and not being scared of things that I guess scare you. Um, and I was just wondering, what was the riskiest decision that you made or something that really scared you but turned out well? Oh, that turned out well? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I went over to the RNC to try to help McCain. That didn't work out very well, I guess. So, when I say take risks, just be fully aware that a lot of you know they don't always have a happy ending. Um, and, but that's you know that's not bad. I mean, I think of think of a chef, you know, a great chef that's cooking this remarkable ten course dinner. And he's got like all these pots and stuff, and like a couple of them boil over, you know, he ruins the rice or something. So what? I mean, you know, the rest of the dinner is going to be great. So don't operate your life like any failure is, is conclusive. Everybody fails. Everybody fails. I was, um, uh, Rush Limbaugh gives a great speech. Uh, some of you may have heard it about how he failed like 10 different times in his life until you know, things finally broke for him. Um, you know, um, so uh, don't worry about don't worry about failure. But anyway, I don't know things that have, I've, I've been I've been very very lucky. Um, well, I I guess you know I guess having I've been gone to work for President Reagan the first time. You know, he won the second time. The first time was I know these are ancient years for you, but. Um, 1976, Reagan ran for the first time and he lost. And he ran against the incumbent president, which is guaranteed not to get a lot of accolades from people in town here. And But, I mean, I was fully invested in Ronald Reagan by then, so I went to work for him. And when he lost that convention, the conventional wisdom would have been that was the end of him. He was 65 years old. He was leaving the governor of California. He had left the governorship of California. Um, you know, he had alienated a large part of the establishment, and the conventional wisdom would tell you that you'd never hear anything else from him. And then, of course, four years later, he runs again and he wins. And so, you know, you're in for a dime, you're in, you're in for a dollar, you're in for another dollar. And so I went to work uh, for him the second time, and we wound up winning. And I'll frankly admit I've been dining out on Ronald Reagan for 25 years now. But, um, but that worked out pretty well. else? Okay. Well, you're a great group. Um, I, as I say, I hope you have a tremendous summer. Just take this opportunity to learn and do as many things as you possibly can, and um, best of luck to you when you get back to college this fall. Thank you.